I remember about 20 years ago, I asked my, I, my father asked me, What's, what would be your wish with your Torah? So I said, I want it to be that 24-7 people should be listening to my shiurim. So my father said to me, 24-7? You don't want people to be listening to your tapes on Shabbos? So I said, yes, I do. I want them to be listening to it in Australia. And I will tell you a beautiful story. There was a couple who uh, could not have children. And they were in Eretz Yisrael, and they went to this world-renowned doctor, and he made all kinds of computations with them. And they had a unique case, and he said, this day, you must try to become pregnant. And they went home to write it down on the calendar, and they saw that that day was Yom Kippur. Oh. So at that time, they went to Rav Shach to ask Rav Shach if there's any heter for them on Yom Kippur. So Rav Shach said, absolutely not. You can't. It's a, it's a biblical prohibition. But he said, I would like you to go to the Belzereb and ask him the question. Maybe he has some insight for you. So they went to the Belzereb. The Belzereb opened a drawer, gave them an envelope with $5,000 and told them to fly to Australia. <laughs> Australia, Yom Kippur was the next day. That's, that's what we call Das Teira. That's what we call Chachma uh, By the way, I know this couple. They became pregnant that night, and they had a child. So, yeah, that's it. Um, Anyway, I was in the middle of apologizing to you for keeping you waiting. We call this starting off the year right. The acid test of whether our Yom Kippur was a fruitful one is to see if anything starts off differently now. That's very important. The, if you looked at the vidui that we said on Yom Kippur, all those al all those al as we clapped our hearts, you know, they say over a very nice thing, that the reason why you, why do we use a fist? So you'll say, we use a fist because that's how you punch, your heart, how you did this, you did this to me, right? right? But the famous pshat is, is that, Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel, I'm in trouble. Is there any way for me to buy myself time? So Daniel told him the famous Aramaic statement, Redeem your sins with charity. And it says Daniel gave a lot of charity, bought himself another year. So the reason why we clap like this is because we're tight-fisted. If our hand would be open, we wouldn't have to clap because we would have redeemed the sins. But if you're holding, that, holding the cash, you're not giving it. So that's why we have to clap. That's, that's the famous answer. But there was a rabbi who was killed by the Nazis. What a loss. What a genius. What an a man, the understanding of humanity. He said as follows. There was in the deep areas of Africa a very rare monkey. This monkey commanded a six-figure price tag. Everybody hunted this monkey. This monkey was known to have a taiva, a desire, for spiced rice. Like Chinese, right? Pungent rice, spiced rice. 
So they used to make a trap with freshly cooked rice, spiced, just the way it liked it. They would put it in a box, and then there would be a cover over the box with a hole. And the monkey could stick its hand into the hole. But then when it fills it with rice, and the hand was full, it couldn't get it out. So you say, let go of the rice. No, the monkey wouldn't let go of the rice. Monkey wouldn't let go of the rice. Wouldn't let go of the rice. Ah, I just took the cup, you know. I wouldn't let go of the rice. So it's trapped there because it wouldn't let go of the rice. So save your life. Let go of the rice. No. That's why we do it with a fist. Because Hashem says, just let go of the sins. Just let go. We don't let go. We're clapping, but we're not letting go. It's a big problem. They say another marshal. It's a beautiful marshal. Beautiful marshal. Uh, country hick goes to the big town for the first time. He's in the big city. Right? And he sees mannequins. He never saw a mannequin. And the mannequins had suits on them. So he, he says, wow, look at this. He's in his overhaul jeans, and there's a pinstripe gorgeous suit. I mean, whoa. whoa. So he goes over to the clerk. He says, could I try one of these suits? He says, sure. Uh, let me take your size. He takes out his measuring spool, takes his waist, his collar. His, you know, some people's arms are one longer than the other. He measures his arms, his shoulders. He brings them out. He says, you're going to look like a million dollars. Farmer goes into the dressing room, he comes out. This doesn't fit. You don't know what you're doing. She so says, Sir, you have to take off your clothes. Don't put it on top of your clothes. It's not gonna fit. People want to do chuva, but they don't take off their old clothes. They don't stop what they were doing. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. I'm going to tell you. I read Mafta Yoina this, this Yom Kippur. And when I read Mafta Yoina, I was inspired. Reading Mafta Yoina, the holiest Aliyah, and the holiest day of the year, I was inspired. And I had some thoughts that I want to share with you, fresh off Yom Kippur. The first thing is, is they're on the boat, and this boat was going down like the Titanic, except it had no lifeboats. This was going down with everybody. And it was happening soon. And the man of God, the holy man, he's sleeping downstairs. So the captain wakes him up and he says, Lama what are you doing sleeping? You're sleeping now? We're going down with the ship. This is not a time to sleep. And I said to myself, wow. We're hearing this right before Ni'ilah. People come to Ni'ilah, they're already wiped out. They're thinking about the coffee and the cake, and the whiskey. Lama l'chan them. That's what you're thinking about? Your whole life is that? It's hanging in the balance? That's what you're thinking about? Lama l'chan them. So then, the captain of the ship, this captain of this ship was no country bumpkin. He was no slouch. You know, I don't know if you know from people that know the sea. People that know the sea can smell a storm already 24 hours before. They know. They feel it in their bones. They know. This storm came out of nowhere. He knew this was not normal. He knew that this was the wrath of God. And therefore, he said, let's cast lots. What an idea. Let's cast lots to see Lamy. Who's causing this? Who's causing this? Who's, who's causing this? I had a thought. Wouldn't it be chilling if a Malik came into the room today, right here, and say, let's cast lots to see who's causing problems? Would that be chilling? 
that gives us a moment to think. It always bothered me. I, I don't know what the Svardi, we have Svardim here, right? Any Svardim here? Yeah. Is the Svardi custom also to say Baruch Shem out loud? Yes. Yeah? Okay. It always bothered me. You know, one day a year we belt out Baruch Shem out loud. I say Kol Nidre this year. Right? So we say Baruch Shem, right? Baruch Shem! Usually the whole year. So most people understand it's because the Moshe Rabbeinu surreptitiously stole this praise from the Malachim. So the whole year we don't want to get the Malachim angry, so we say it low. Shh. But on Yom Kippur we're angelic. We're fasting, we're not drinking, we're not eating, we're not wearing shoes, we're like angels. So we could say it. It always bothered me, this chat. Yeah, the Baruch Shem that we say before Hashem Hu Elohim. Right, we say seven times, Hashem, Hu HaElohim, Hashem, Hu HaElohim. By the way, what that means is we're escorting Hashem back through the seven Rakias, the seven heavens, because he's been with us, and now he's going back. He was Hashem, he does Arachim, he's going back to the kids of Elohim. So we escort him, Hashem, Hu HaElohim, Hashem, Hu HaElohim. But before that, we belt out Baruch three times, Baruch, shame. So I understand after fasting for 25 hours, okay, I can understand that we're angelic. But Mariv, by Kal Nidre night, we also said Baruch, shame out loud. What kind of angels are we? We stuffed bellies from the whole meal that we stuffed ourselves, brownies and fruit soup and soda and water and honey. We can't even close our belts with so stuff, right? Real angelic, right? How can we say Baruch Shem? This kasha always bothered me. So I found another answer. I found another answer. That's so important. Remember when I, Yaakov wanted to reveal the cakes, the end of time to his sons. Bikesh Yaakov liklos es ha-keitz. Torch ha-shkina mimem. The shkina departed. So he was worried. Welcome. He was worried. He was worried that maybe this one of the boys, one of the shvatim, were not, were not what they seemed to be. So they all said in unison, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elikeinu, Hashem Echad. We're one. We cleaned up our act. So Yaakov said, Baruch Hashem, Kvayd Malchus, Alam, Vayat, Ah, Baruch Hashem. That's Achdos. You could only say Baruch Hashem when you have Achdos. The whole year, people have grudges, they have enmity, this one's fighting with our sister, this one's fighting with his boss, this one's not getting along with the person next in the shul, this one's not getting along with parents. Comes Yom Kippur. We're all meichel each other. Anu matilim lespalim avaryanim. We make a deal with God. I forgive. You forgive me. It's a real time. This act that we could say baruch shem out loud, even in the beginning of Yom Kippur. So I had a thought. It's really something to think about. You clap al chetchik atonu lefanecha begilu yarois. You know what that means? For the sin that I, we sinned with immorality. Now, I was told that this is a God-fearing group. Nobody here is immoral, right? No, no, no they're not immoral. Please don't answer if you ask. <laughs> <laughs> You're not immoral. But everybody here, myself included, <laughs> a brothel. I sure hope nobody here visits the brothel. So, but you did it, and you hit your heart. <laughs> it's not the brothel. <laughs> Although I'm in the middle of shit. Um, uh, 
the uh, the <laughs> the uh, no, it was the children. Uh, we do it because we have other people in mind. But do you know what that exercise is doing? You say, how could I be Michael, this person? How could I be Michael? You know what he did to me? But you just clapped al Lefanecha for the world. So you're asking for forgiveness for those people that you're angry for. How could you have it both ways? How could you ask forgiveness for them and also be angry at them? Ah. That's the objective. That's the objective. By clapping and asking for forgiveness, we're saying, I can't remain angry. I'm asking you to forgive the most hardened criminals. I have a Kabbalah. I have a tradition. I'm living. Can I have some Coke? I have a tradition. I have a... I have a tradition from the great Rebbes of yesteryear, not now, the ancient Rebbes, that punishment comes in this world, not for sins between us and God. Thank you very much. Amen. Excuse me. Not for the sins between us and God. No, here, this is fun. Not for the sins between us and God. That for that, there's Gehenna. Punishment in this world comes as sins between us and our fellow man, our fellow woman. That's why you'll find primarily all the al are about relationships with each other. Lashen hara, tipshes peh, sesumas yod, which is loans, kapa shoichad, bribes, all, so many things with the mouth, dibur peh, bitu yisvasayim, all about relationships. Because that's what people suffer from. And that's what we have to work on in the coming year. We have to work on being nicer, being gentler, being more sensitive, being caring, not being selfish, not being self-centered. That's what we have to work on. We have to... It's a new aschala. It says kol aschalas koshes, which is a double-edged meaning. On the one hand, it means all starts are tough. It's true, because if you start, you want to be different, it's tough. But it also means something else. Kolas, kolas, koshes. All starts have to be hard. You have to really, really work hard. That should be, it should start good. One of the things, one of the frontiers that we have to work on in our time, it's one of the, the final frontiers, so to speak. The, we keep Shabbos. We learn Torah. We give tzedakah. We do chesed. But our davening, our brachas, how are they? I heard a great story this summer. Absolutely great story. You can't make up such a story. You simply can't make up such a story. It ha I got this so story from Rabbi Elias who heard it from Rabbi Newman of Cleveland. 
I actually wrote up this story. I don't know if it printed yet, or if it ran yet, but I wrote up the story. Um, what happened was, is a yeshiva boy was by the kosel, by the kotel, and he saw an obvious BT, Baal Tshuva, standing by the wall. He was obvious, he had a jet's cap perched on his head with a colorful windbreaker, a red windbreaker, and green pants. And, you know, not your traditional fear, especially not for the Kotel, you know. And he was davening with tremendous kavana. And then after his devotions, he took out a piece of paper and wrote down a very precise kvittel and stuck it in the wall. This yeshiva man was, you know, it, he was a sight, you know, a bunch of talasim by the wall, and you have this green jet cap, red jacket sticking out there, and uh, he's shuckling more than them all. So the yeshiva boy doesn't know what came over him, but he pulled out the kvittel from the wall to read it. He pulls out the kvittel, and it says as follows. Dear God, I find myself isolated for the first time in my life in this place called Eisha Torah. It's the first time I ever went without knowing the scores of the Jets. If you're really out there, could you get me the scores? That's what it said. That's his prayer. That was, that's what it said. Yeshiva man pulls out his cell phone, calls his friend Chaim in America, Chaim, I have no time to explain. Quick, get me the latest standings of the Jets. Oh, my. <laughs> he gets the scores. He sees the man with the jet cap bobbing. He says, sir, sir. The man turns around. He says, I could always see a fellow Jet fan from your cap. He says, yeah, I love the Jets. He says, I, I'm sure you want to know what the latest scores are. The, these are the scores. The man goes like this. <laughs> so you think the story is over it's way far from over this story makes its way to Brisk to Rav Soveitchik Rav Soveitchik hears the story and he says you probably drew a conclusion that was, that was a very clever young man he says you've completely drawn the wrong conclusion he says, that's not the lesson. The lesson is that the incredibly devotes, devoted, sincere prayer of this Baal Tshuva got that yeshiva boy to take the kvittel out of the wall. Got that yeshiva boy to call his friend in America. That's the lesson. The lesson is the power of prayer. And that's something that a lot of us have to work on. We, d we all daven, but we all have to know that davening helps. It makes a difference. There's a lot of people that daven, but they don't really feel that they're dying. I got to daven, but uh, you know, God, he's going to do what he thinks is best anyway. It's, uh, it's not true. God wasn't giving this guy the jet score, but his feeler got him the scores. Right? Uh, that's a funny thing to daven for. You know? But you talk about shidduch crisis. Tefillah's help. Parnosa crisis. Tefillah helps. All these things, sincere prayer helps. If you're married, you should never go a davening, ever, without praying for your spouse. Never. It's a turn-off to Hashem that a husband davens and doesn't think about his wife. That a wife davens and doesn't, that's loyalty. The dovak beishtay means to be loyal to a wife. To daven for Klal Yisrael. There's so many people that are sick. You say refa enu. There's a whole floor in 
Columbia Presbyterian's Children's Hospital with children with cancer. Burn units are full of yidin. I had another thought about Yaina. Another interesting thought about Yaina. Yaina, listen carefully. God came to Yona and told him, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them that they have to repent, otherwise I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to nuke them. It's going to be a Hiroshima. It'll be another Sedoin. Now, till this year, I never realized that in the name Ninveh is embedded the name Yonah. Isn't that amazing? Ninveh has all the letters of Yonah. Nun, Yud, Nun, Vav, He. So in Ninveh is embedded Yonah. Yonah's fate was inexorably intertwined with Ninveh. But when God told Yonah to go and chastise and warn Ninveh, Yonah didn't want to do it. Because Yonah knew with his vision, he was a great prophet, that Ninveh would listen, they would repent, and they would mend their ways. And then that would put us in a very bad light. Because here, as a Navi, he's been chastising the Jews, and we didn't repent. And here Hashem will say, the guy him do it, and you don't. And that would bring a kitrig. It would bring bad on Klal Yisrael. So Jonas says, I'm not doing it. Now, I'm not doing it. You know, you could tell me I'm not doing it. I could tell you I'm not doing it. But you can't tell God I'm not doing it. A Navi, if he's guilty of being koivesh es nevuasai, of holding back his nevua, he's chayiv nisa. He's liable for death. Death, death. But what did he do? He booked the cruise. He booked the cruise to Tarshish. You know why? Because he wanted to get to Chutzot. So now he can't give Navua outside of Eretz So he booked, they booked the cruise to Tarshish. He says, I'm out of here. And now what did he do? He went to sleep. Because he said, look, I'm disobeying God. At least let me not do it while I'm awake. So he went to sleep. At least I'm, I'm not up. So he, he was koivish es nevu also he described, that's why Yosef, remember when he was given the dream, he told the brothers, why did he tell the brothers? He made them jealous. He put himself in trouble. But it was a nevu, you can't withhold the nevu. But Yaina did it. When they threw him in the water, he didn't know a whale would come and swallow him and rescue him and spit him out. That's, that's, that's far-fetched. He thought he was going to die. But he was willing to die because he didn't want to call yourself to be hurt. That's why we lame it on Yom Kippur. Because the story of Yain is a story of Avas Yisrael. That's what the story of Yain is. That's what we have to feel when we come out of Yom Kippur. You have to bury the grudges, bury the pettiness. Now we talk about our tefillos. We want our tefillos to be effective. We want them to reach heaven. You know, there are a lot of tefillahs. Somebody says, you know, I, I davened a lot of times for this, you know. <laughs> I davened. You know, there are, there, are, there are married people that tell me, look, I davened for Shalom Bayes already for 20 years. It's not working. So let me tell you something. There's a story with the Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov went into a shul and they asked him, how's our tefillos? How are they doing? So the Baal Shem Tov says, your shul is full of tefillos. So they smiled. <laughs> so it's not so good. 
It's full of tefillas because they're all sitting there. They don't have power to go up to Shemayim. Baal Shem Tov said there's a Zoya. The Zoya says for tefillah to get up to heaven, it has to have two wings. One wing is Avas Hashem, and one wing is Yiras Hashem. Love and fear. And I, I, I wanted to take this and say that's why we dive in Avinu Malkeinu. Because we preface our prayer with the two wings. Avinu, our father, that's love. Malkeinu, our king, that's fear. When it has the two wings, then we could say, Kra Roya Gazardine. Then we could say, Shlach Rufu Shalei Malacholi Amech. Talk about starting off the year right. This Yom Kippur was Shabbos. Shabbos Shabbos. So I proposed before Ni'ilo when I spoke that we make some kind of Shabbos commitment. It's a big thing. We're going to have the first Shabbos after Yom Kippur, the Shabbos Chalamoyed Sukkot. Let's make it different. You know, Shabbos is the Mekor bracha. It's the source of blessing. Shabbos has therapeutic powers that even a generation that worshipped idolatry, like the Dor Enish, if they would have kept Shabbos, they would have been forgiven. So let's do something different, Shabbos. So you say, what? There are many suggestions. If you talk in Shul, Stop talking in Shul. Now that's not easy. If you're always talking, it's not easy. It's like stopping to smoke. So here's the secret. I'll tell you how to stop. It works. Switch your seat. It's simple. Look, you're talking all the time with people there. You're not going to stop. It's not nice. You don't want to be a snob. Switch your seat. So you'll say, yeah, but I'm not a front kind of guy, the front of the show. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm a back kind of guy. Don't say it that way. Say, I'm not a Ghanaian kind of guy. I'm a Ghanaian kind of guy. <laughs> person that talks in shul goes to Ghana. Go to Lavoy in Minnesota. That's a big sight. It's a big sight. Now let's say you don't talk in shul. That's not your problem. So then sing Zmiris by the table. Talk to the family. Sing Zmiris by the table. Let's say you sing Zmiris. Okay. Say a Dvar Torah by the table. It doesn't have to be brain surgery. I don't have time to prepare. You don't have to say a treatise. You don't have to say a pshetel. Simple thing. You come to the Pasha, Bereshis. You tell the children, you know, if you're jealous, it could kill you. That's what happened with Cain and Hevel. Jealousy, you have to stay away from jealousy. Well, you tell them. It says that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. That's what we're supposed to think when we take a bite of cholent or a bite of chamin. It didn't come about from a big bang. It didn't come about over a billion years. It wasn't always here. It was created in six days, and God rested and said, that's what we're doing on Shabbos. Or, here's another Shabbos commitment. It's a nice commitment. Nice commitment. I'm going to make sure to learn a little more Torah on Shabbos. The whole week I'm busy. But Shvi Lashem Alikach. I know I like to sleep, and I like to read papers. Going to take a big cipher that all the children should see. You know, we know that it says that if you say Kriyashma without filling, it's Kameid Edut Sheker Alatz. 
like you're testifying falsely. Because here you're saying Kriyashma, and it says, Ukshatam Oisal Yedachin, now we're in Tvil. So Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld said the same thing. If you don't spend time teaching your children Torah, you're made a check al Atzma. You're testifying falsely because it says, Vishinantam Levanach. I'll tell you another one. If you never open a safer in the house, you don't open a safer in the house. You, you go to a shear, but in the house, the only thing you open is the Daily News, the New York Times, maybe the Ami magazine. It's the only thing you open. The only time you go to your swarm is by Vidikis Khamis. That's the only time. So then that's made a good checker on Atzma. You may have made a checker on yourself because it says, You're speaking about that when you're sitting in your house. Gotta make it. There's a famous story. Famous story. Rav Zilberstein tells the story. He gives, an, he gives a, uh, a night shear. And uh, I, probably not as late as me. I get very late. But uh, he gives a late share. Maybe it is. I don't know. He gives a late share. And there's a man in the share that comes in. And after five minutes, he falls asleep and he starts to snore. <laughs> it's impossible to say the share. They have to wake him up. They wake him up. A minute later. <laughs> So Rav Zilberstein goes over to him. He says, you know, I love to have you by the ship, but obviously you're wiped out. You're falling asleep. Go home, go to sleep, and get up early in the morning. So he says, I can't do that. He says, why not? He says, if I get up early in the morning, my children are still sleeping. They don't see Abba going to learn. In the night, they hear Abba going to learn Torah, that's Kinnah. So the Zilberstein says to him, that's a very, very proper way of thinking. I just have one adjustment. I think you should get up early and go learn anyway because you're sleeping very good over here. <laughs> you can get up early and go to the shit. I have it also. I have somebody by me also. But as soon as I start talking, I always feel that I, I'm... Uh, Rabbi Wine said that certain Rabbanim could uh, join the Anesthesiologist <laughs> Guild of America. Uh, I once asked Rabbi Moshe, Ramosha Feinstein, when I brought him water to wash when he came out of the base of Kise, and he said, Asher Yotzer, and he said, She'im yefoseach echad mehem, or yisoseim echad mehem. If one of the organs open or one of the organs seal, yefsher liskayen v'lamod lefanecha, it's impossible to exist and stand before you afilu shoechos even for one hour. The Afilu Shoechos is in parentheses. He said Afilu Shoechos. So I once asked him, why does the Rosh Shiva say Afilu Shoechos? If a person is constipated, you could survive an hour. I mean, <laughs> even Rahman al with a tumor, Loyalainu, a person survives an hour. What does it mean? It's not true. So Ramesha said to me with a smile, he said, what's Kiyom? Kiyom is just existing? He says, Kiyom is to be able to learn Torah untroubled. If a person has a malfunction, he can't learn untroubled. He's worried about it. That's not Kiyom. That's what he told me. And I was thinking about it recently. And I was thinking, I didn't realize the profundity of what he told me. 
In Asher Yatsa we say that we have Nikavim, Nikavim, we have orifices. Chalulim, Chalulim, many hollow organs. Sheim yifaseach achmeim, if something hemorrhages, a, a vessel bursts, Rachman al or you saw say mechamehem, or there's a cyst, a blockage, a tumor, Rachman al tzon. I efshel eskayim velamal lefanecha afilu shoechas. We invoke Torah. And we say, Hashem, don't do that to us because we want to learn Torah. That's why we make that mention. That's why we throw in that afilu shoechas. And therefore, Torah protects us. We need to have Torah. Women have to raise children to make Torah a priority. They have to show their husbands that they're proud of them. Comes a Sunday, look, you want to do Torah first? That comes first. Then we'll plan anything after that. Comes a Matzah Shabbos. You want to start to be Mavi Sedra for the week before we even get to anything else? Go for it. That's protecting our home. That's a big thing. We have to realize, both men and women together, we have to realize that Torah, Torah protects us. Ki heim chayeinu v'yarech yameinu. Orech yamim b'yamina b'smail ha'yishe v'chavayit. Tyre is everything. I found when I was here the last time that when I opened the floor to some questions, the island enjoyed, enjoyed it. So maybe we'll do that with a few ground rules. Questions, not a debate. I don't have debates. I'm not... Uh, I'm not running for mayor of New York. Also, I'll, I'll often answer your question, but I might not know the answer. So please forgive me if I say I don't know. I might not know. Um, first, if anybody has any, not halacha, you have a rub for that. If anybody has any hashkafic questions about Sukkot, Sukkot, so let's start with that. Does anybody have any Sukkot questions? First, yes. What's the main message of today? Okay. Sukkot, the main, me what's the main message of Sukkot? The main message of Sukkot is, first of all, why is Sukkot seven days? It's a strange thing. What, you see, Pesach is seven days, because from when we went out to Mitzrayim till the miracle of the Yamsa for seven days. And that's why this Chalamite in the middle. Yitzhak Mitzrayim was a great miracle. And Kriyat Yamsa was a great miracle. The middle days were full of fear and trepidation. Nine million Egyptians chasing us. But we had miracles, so it's quasi. But why is Sukkot seven days? Sukkot, we commemorate 40 years in the desert under the divine cloud of glory. 40 isn't even divisible by seven. It will be 10 days, so then it's 10, 10 is divisible, right? Four days, it's four decades, seven days? What seven days? What does it mean? So we're taught the Sefer Matamim, which is one of the oldest Minhagim Swarm, says it's seven days because there were seven clouds. 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 There was a cloud above us protecting us from the sun in the day and the cold in the night and also around the four sides of us. That's five. There was a cloud underneath that acted as a conveyor belt and it leveled the ground and killed the snakes and the scorpions. And there was a cloud in the front that led the way. Seven clouds. Now there were many miracles. There was a well of Miriam it was a rock. This was some rock. Talk about a water cooler. <laughs> this was a rock that was mobile and gave three million people to drink. It's one of the greatest miracles of all time. Imagine a traveling Niagara Falls 
all contained in a rock. There was a man, the man from heaven, that fell at your doorstep, together with cosmetics, Maybelline, Revlon. This is brought down in the Gemara and Yuma. But the theme is the cloud of glory. Why? Because it's to remind us that it's not the medical lack. It's not the Sloanim shield that protects us. It's God that always protects us. And that if we want to be secure, we have to have shkin in our home. That's the lesson of Sukkot. And the only way to have shkin in the home is if there's shalom by it. That's why in Europe they used to advise a chosen and kala, don't go to sleep until you make up with one another. Because it's not safe to go to sleep without the Shekhinah. It's the Anani HaKovet that protects us. That's the lesson that we learn on Sukkot. You had a question? Yeah. It always bothers me about Jonah and the whale. I don't know. And I said to somebody, and they said to me, oh, that's a fable. And I don't... What bothers you? That does he actually get swallowed? A hundred percent. He got swallowed, and Hashem made a miracle that he was able to exist in the belly of the whale for so three days. The digestion and everything. Huh? That's correct. He was swallowed and he went straight down into the huge stomach of the whale without the peristalsis chopping him up. It was a huge miracle. But it's not a fable. Yes. Speaking of Yonah, Yonah, when he says the 13 attributes of, right. of you know, Hashem, how come he missed out Emmett? Uh, so want, he wants to know why, obviously, he didn't say the 13, right? He didn't say Emmet. And the answer is, Emmet is a very difficult attribute of mercy. The most mercy is that Hashem should bend the truth. Here we are. It says sin should cause man to die. And we're asking Hashem for mercy. That's not truth. Truth is that you committed a crime against God. Truth demands that you should die. Not you. One should die. So, what, what, how is MS an attribute of mercy? So it's a very, very, very uh, unusual circumstance. You see, here's a person that makes himself like a tzaddik. He davens in the front of the shul, he shackles. Now, as a tzaddik, tzaddikim are judged very strictly. Right? So, on Rosh Hashanah, the angels of mercy say, don't judge him strictly. He's a phony. He's not a tzaddik. Don't judge him strictly. Be truthful. He's a bum. As a bomb, he doesn't deserve to be judged on so. That's Emmas. That's Emmas. But that's a very, um, that's a very, very narrow usage of Emmas. Because normally, Emmas would not be an attribute of mercy. For most of us, Emmas would get us in trouble. We say, Hashem. Hashem, yilu ratzay nimrei fi vehegan libi lefanecha. Listen, Hashem, to the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart. And Hashem says, do you really want me to listen to the thoughts of your heart? Yach! Emes gets a person in a lot of trouble. Emes is a dangerous thing. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, this is the reason why the reason why, if you notice in a lot of shuls when they say Shema Kaleinu out loud, the Pasuk of Yilu Ratzin Imre Fi and the Pasuk of Bino Hagigenu, which means uh, hearken to our, our, our thoughts, we don't say that out loud. Because it's kind of dangerous to say it out loud. It's like somebody says, Yehi Chastecha Hashem Aleinu. Let your kindness be upon us, to the amount that we hope to you. 
do we really want Hashem to only be kind as much as we hope to Him? What happens if we haven't hoped to Him in a while? It's a little dangerous stuff. A little dangerous stuff. I, I sometimes say when I give a shir and everybody runs out afterwards, I say, what happened to Ashrei Yoshrei Vizah? Have to watch what we say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, this, this year was the fourth anniversary of the Yom Kippur War and also 9-11, both of which happened at the, at around the same time. Is there any message of fact why those things happened this time of year? Well, they happened around the time of Kisavo. Kis, the parish of Kisavo, which is the time of God's chastisements. And we must know that this is a time of when Elul is ani dodi vidodili. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. And that's a direct proportion. If I'm not to my beloved, then my beloved is not to me. It's a dangerous time. You know, it's like a father tells his son, you know what? This week, I decided I'm not spending enough time with you. This week, I'm taking off from work. I'm yours. And the son decides to go away that week. That's chutzpah. Father made it. Hashem makes it his business to be available to us. And people go on at business as usual. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Now, I uh, first of all want to thank all of you for coming. It's very, very nice to start off the year together with you. Um, we have over here my, my svarim, uh, my, uh, my uh, passion Jewsism, meaningful living, power benching. But we have something new this year. Just to show you, uh, my power benching came out in the pocket size. Uh, it came out in two different traditions. It came out in a Simcha edition and also in a regular edition. Um, they're each $10. Uh, I am actively looking for people to sponsor it to get it into high schools. Because uh, like some people sponsored it in certain high schools in Flappish, if you sponsor it in a high school, this edition I'd be willing to give multiple copies for three dollars, which is less than my cost price, but I'm anxious to get it into high schools. So if anybody wants to sponsor motor, for any kind of high, high school, please talk to me about it, and uh, and um, uh, that's available. Uh, I have two CDs here: one on Sukkis and one uh, on Beratius. If anybody wants, um, I want to conclude with one thought. Um, I want to conclude with one thought. We have a lot of people that are in very big need. People are, houses are facing foreclosure. People just can't make ends meet. With, with the medical costs and the tuition, they just can't make it. If you have money to help people, Opportunity knocks. And the truth of the matter is, is it's a way to become rich. There's a three-word recommendation by Chazal. Melech Mamain Chaser. Now, in order to understand what this means, in the olden days when they didn't have refrigeration, when they went on a boat journey, if they wanted the meat to be preserved, they salted it heavily. Salt was the preservative. Melech mamain chaser. The salt, the preservative of money, is to give some of it away. People don't understand that. We're talking about there are people 
that children, they can't afford to give snacks to their children. You want a great idea? You have to do it cleverly, not to embarrass. If you know how to do it, not to embarrass. You have a family in your community with a large family that is struggling. Tell them you want to buy the shoes for the children for the new year. You know how much it costs to take a, eight children to the shoe store to get them a Shabbos shoe and a weekday shoe? You know how much it costs? And they don't have the money. And if you could help them with that, then every moment that the child walks, you're getting a schos. Nah. I learned this idea from my wife's father. My wife's father, Rabbi Aaron ben Ramayusha Geltuch, used to pay for shoes for a family. What a beautiful idea. What a beautiful idea. There's another thing. There's a shidduch Christ. One of the reasons for the Shidduch crisis is not talked about a lot. Nowadays, you've got to be very proactive. There's a lot of girls that their parents are, excuse me, quiet like mice. They don't know how to network. They just can't do it. And these girls don't get phone calls because nobody is really looking for them. Some parents know they're, you know, tumblers. They're, they call this one, they call that one, they bother this one, they bother that. Other parents. You know a family like that. Take the girl under your wings and make calls for her. Don't take anything away from the parents. You turn it over to the parents. Put tumble for them. It's a big chesed. In the merit of our Torah, our tefillah, our chesed, with appreciation to chazak. May we all have a year of good health, no scares, happiness, and everything well.